the reading and the text of this afternoon, Psalm 2, my book, my Bible, is the heading, The Reign of the Lord's Anointed. Let's listen to the word of God as follows. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take on counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart, cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens lies. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son today. I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nation your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. By coming to church this afternoon, and also the whole day, of course, on Sunday, and by being here in the presence of the Lord, that makes us the richest people of the world, in the world. The book of Psalms characterizes our rich condition as blessed. That's how the book of Psalms opens, blessed. The previous time I was ministering God's word to you, it was on Psalm 1, as already indicated. That psalm shows us the two ways of life. It's the godly one and the ungodly one. The narrow way and the broad way. A life on that broad way will shrivel up. People on that way will be blown away as chaff. But the godly walking on the small way on God's way will be richly blessed. They are even called blessed. That man will flourish and prosper, and God will gather them in his granary. They will be always safe and receive all that he is in need of, the blessed one. Now this afternoon, we focus on Psalm 2. Psalm 1 and 2 are closely connected. Both Psalms, as it were, they complement each other. They form, therefore, also the introduction of the whole book of Psalms. We could say that Psalm 1 and 2 introduce the book of Psalms as God's book of comfort for life in a hostile and sinful world. At the same time, the book of Psalms reminds us that we are God's people. And they we are God's covenant people, his chosen ones, his, his chosen children. With him we, we walk through life. But if we wander off, then we are in danger. We'll be destroyed. We'll perish. 
for he that enters to all is sovereign. But if we are faithful on his way, we will be blessed. You see, the words way and blessing in Psalm 2 really immediately connects to Psalm 1. Also speaks about blessing in God's way. And uh, that psalm shows that we are well off with the counsel of the Lord at the streams, Psalm 1, that we are well at the streams, that we are fed by the streams of God. That is with His Word. And we also have a blessed life in the assembly. And as we heard this morning, in the assembly of God, it is Christ Church. Psalm 2 then, it takes up the final statement of Psalm 1, that the Lord is in control. The Lord always keeps control. He's victorious. He's victorious through his anointed one. And so God's word comes to us as follows, that the sovereign Lord executes his counsel through his anointed one. And his anointed one is his son. And briefly, therefore, the message is because of that, that we are under God's reign, we are, and we should not, we should not be alarmed. So don't be alarmed. God's son reigns. And he judges the rebellious people, first, Point, the second point, he establishes his kingdom among the nations. And finally, he requires humble submission of all the earth. So don't be alarmed. God's son reigns. He judges the rebellious people. He establishes his kingdom among the nations. And he requires humble submission of all the earth. But Psalm 2 makes me think of a slideshow or a PowerPoint presentation. Such a presentation makes it possible to show pictures in a certain arrangement. After one picture is shown, another pops up. With the next picture, with the next picture following, and so on. And at the end, the slides or windows can be arranged around the main one. Now that's what Psalm 2 is doing, as it were. The first window is opened in verse 1 and 3 and shows us the restless and arrogant people on the earth. Verses 1, 2 and 3. How they are busy with empty and futile things. Then the second window opens in the verses 4 through to 6. It shows heaven. There the Lord is on his glorious throne. He is in charge of everything and everyone. And he's doing his rule, his reigns through the king that he has. Or then, then a third window pops over. It shows us what the immediate instruction is to all the peoples. And that teaching, that instruction is then submit to this Lord and God. Finally, in the last sentence, verse 12, B, the final window opens. With all the other pictures of the speaking at the background, showing God's wrath and his love, his curse and his blessing. Well, what pops out at us at the very end? Indeed, it is the gospel word throughout Scripture, as already indicated this afternoon. The blessed statement, the beautiful statement, blessed are all who put their trust in Him. Indeed, the blessing you meet 
in all of scripture. One example of the many is, for example, Psalm 84, a beautiful psalm of uh, being saved with the Lord. Psalm 84 also blessed, uh, ends with that blessing. It confirms, blessed is the one who puts its trust in the living God. And so we got the teaching of this PowerPoint presentation on Psalm, psalm 2. Indeed, is don't be alarmed. You are fine and safe always with the Son of God. Through Him, God deals with the powers on the earth. Yes, Psalm 2 shows the relation between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdoms on earth. Who is it that in that relation takes a pivotal place? He is called my son. Having seen this, we now go back to the different windows to look at them a little bit closer. First then, the first one, the hustle and bustle of mankind. That is, uh, the, that are the verses one, two, and three. It immediately shows all that is going on on earth. It can be described Actually, also, all that can be described in one word. And that one word is revolution. A revolution is a turbulent change caused by uproar against the rulers. Psalm 2 says that this happens against the Lord anointed. In verse 6, references that made to God's king and sign. And we know, we know who that is. Of course, David. According to 2 Samuel 7, the Davidic kingship was an everlasting one. And the Davidic king was then a representative of God's divine rule over his people. Therefore, ultimately, the hostility and rebellion that the nation show is directed against God himself. All that goes on, uh, even if you are, uh, are disturbed about things, don't think immediately of yourself. But all that happens around you against God's law and will, it is first and foremost revolution against God and his chosen servant and that is Christ Jesus our Lord. Rebellious people want to maintain themselves. You see it all around us. In a way it is also with our own nature. But especially rebellious people they want to design for themselves so decide what is good and evil and bad. As you know, I confess that the rebellious attitude started already in paradise. From there we see it flaring up in men like Cain and Laman. They already bred. Ha! Huh. What does God think? We can manage our own life. The same attitude is shown in the people who are building Tower of Babel. Genesis 11. They said, we want to build for ourselves. We want to live for ourselves. We want to determine what works best for ourselves. We can do that because we are powerful. That's basically the unbelieving attitude since man's fall. Arrogant people don't listen to God's word. They don't want the bonds of God's law. They do not submit to God and his son. Let us break their chains, they say. Throw off their fetters. 
congregation. That's why our modern society wants to change things like God has instituted. Think of holy marriage. By many, homosexual union is also called marriage. People more and more turn to pagan spirituality. Often they live a dark and sinister life of death, killing, murder. Yet the sanctity and the purity of God created life is abolished. And that life is pictured in horror, in romance movies you see man rebels against the holy god but what does the living god say about all that earthly and frantic plotting he let the nation know that all their activities are doomed to nothing their disgusting and turbulent life shows the real position and condition they are in. They are under God's wrath. And that's actually meant by the wrath of God. Verse 4. God views the, the views as uh, they look at that unholy life from his sudden perspective. His judgment on man's hatred of God and man's impurity will come. Man's Disobedience, a filthy life, will be severely punished. With a supreme penalty that is, as Lord's Day 4 says and confesses, the supreme penalty is the eternal punishment of body and soul. Man's rebellious world of evil, it won't last. But will last is God's world. He, his reign will be established among the nations. Indeed, there is one who does not live an unholy and rebellious life for himself. He is God's son. So we have come to our second thought. When a, an announcement in heaven is heard. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. The person who takes up this declaration can only be the king of verse 6. And he recites the decree of the king in heaven, and it has two parts. The first is his designation as the Son of God. The great that God has begotten him on the very day he speaks. Now that language is that of a legal adoption procedure of the time the son was written. The second part of the decree is a promise. The nations are to be the heritage of the son. The sovereign God will establish his kingdom among the nations through him. Now the, accent, the essential point of the psalm is the proclamation. You are my son. You are my son. What is his identity? Well, we need to refer to the teaching of the son himself that he gave in the New Testament, Luke 24. There he showed his disciples that everything in scripture including therefore Psalm 2, speaks of him. Yet, we should not immediately jump to its prophetic fulfillment. We need to consider what Psalm 2 would have meant in the world of the Old Testament. Well, the designation of a king as a son of God has its background in Bible times. In ancient history, the leader became the agent of power and the source of power. It was believed that power flowed from the deity to the people through the king. 
think of why Israel requested the king. Remember, you know, Israel asked Samuel, give us a king. What kind of a king? Give us a king like the other nations have. In the ancient society, then, the king was the provider of three essential needs. Security against enemies, justice and order, and prosperity. Another psalm lists these three items, and that is Psalm 72. A psalm about the royal glory of God through the king. And that psalm starts as follows. Where we are also our service started this afternoon. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness in the royal son. He will judge your people with righteousness, your poor with justice. The mountain will bear prosperity for the people, the hills in righteousness. So, in the Old Testament world, the king was clearly seen as an instrument of life to provide and protect and gave prosperity. <coughs> so those three things, provision, protection, and prosperity. Our sources from Bible times throw light of verse 9 as well. Then we read, a strange thing, you shall break them or rule them. How? You should do so with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Well, without a proper understanding of these words and the setting of its time, we would say, slaying them with a rod of iron is harsh, cruel. The Nazis or ISIS or the Russian Wagner groups, the soldiers of today would do such things. The mother representative of the Holy God in heaven. For congregation in Old Testament time, the words of verse 9 were not meant in a literal way. Behind them is a ritual known particularly from the ceremonies in Egypt. The description in this verse is part of the procedures of installing the king, crowning the king. At such an occasion, the names of the nations over which he would rule were then written on clay tablets. And then in a symbolic code, ritual the king would smash those tablets. He would do so with an iron scepter, indicating that if they would rebel, then they would be severely punished. And bringing this idea across to our world, we could say that this new king shall claim and rule his nations and people with a power that no one should resist. And with this in mind, we turn it to the Bible. Scripture then reveals the secret of God's plan and purpose. That is, God will establish His divine kingdom among the nations. No one will be able to hinder the advance of the glorious kingdom. No one can stop God in pursuing His plan for the coming of his kingdom. And that's why Israel could conquer the Canaanites. They had come under God's wrath, those Canaanites, because they had made a measure of evil full. For the same reason Goliath's head was chopped up, because he terribly defiled the holy God of Israel. David could do so because 
He came to him to Goliath. David came. How did David come to Goliath? In the name of God. In the power of God Almighty. Our Lord in Gethsemane shows the same power. His words, just his speaking, made a whole detachment of soldiers fall to the ground. Just like that. So, all plotting against him will not bring down his work and his work. We have the iron rod, which we now can identify with his thunderous, powerful gospel. The Lord dashes all the all rebellious people. He will dash them to pieces like pottery. He unquestionably has authority over them, and his kingdom stands. The existence of the Christian church all over the world bears witness to that fact that no power, no power can resist Christ's power. Congregation, I ask, where are all the big shots, so to speak? Where are all those big authoritative shots of the past? Where are the tyrants, the dictators, or the big barons? Some of them even declare themselves to be God. Where are the philosophers who glorify the man? Where are the movie makers who started to, tra to trample all God's commandments underfoot? Where are they? They all are blown away by God's powerful life. Through his judgment, they are blown away like a child. So this is the proclamation of the church. The only true king in the world is Jesus Christ. He gives and guarantees life, even our eternal destiny. And he proclaimed the decree of the Lord. You is here, even today. It is powerful word of eternal salvation. It is his powerful rod unto eternal punishment. The Son of God, it is Jesus Christ, reigns forever. The whole world may plot against it. As we can read in the book of Acts, for example, the same happened through our church history. People continue to plot against God's rule. However, Christ's powerful proclamation continues to be heard, even now at this very moment, that he has authority in heaven and on earth. And he only, the Son of God, is true peace and life. Little, puny, noisy, Rebellious man doesn't govern. But don't be alarmed. In today's world, for God's Son reigns. And He is our Lord, Jesus Christ. None is able to stop His work. Submit to Him and live for Him. And that's how Psalm 2 ends, by the opening, the last two windows. Just for the rulers and dictators of the earth, entertainment barons and other powers in the world are not inclined to give, they nevertheless are called to do. They must serve him who thrones in the heavens. Each Davidic king typified him who came on earth as God's Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And he now sits on God's throne. 
His clear proclamation is joy and peace can only be found with him as the king and the ruler of heaven and earth. He is the only divinely ordained instrument for rest and peace. Don't tear the bonds with him asunder. At the end of Psalm 2, we again read an expression which we must understand in the light of ancient times. I refer to that exhortation. Serve the Lord with fear and trembling. Serve the Lord with fear and trembling. Kiss the Son. Well, that phrase, kiss the Son, means kiss his feet. If you leave through an archaeological book of Bible times, often you will see people lying prostrate before a ruler. But are they doing? They are kissing. They kiss the feet. They have kissed the king's feet. And those people then recognize their ruler's sovereignty. By doing that, they acknowledge we are your people. We are your servants. Well, our Lord's glory requires man's obedience and humble submission. Something that unrighteous man is loath to do. However, it is the only way of true life and salvation. That's the instruction of God's word. To honor, to live by. Every Sunday we also hear in the Ten Commandments. And then who is uh, like the reformer Luther did? What did he say? Facing the opposition, he acknowledged, here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, be obedient to my Lord, to his word and commandment, and we need unconditionally submit to Christ, as he did, submit to our Lord and King. Through his redeeming work, God the Father seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. For above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the, in the one to come. As we read in Ephesians 1, 20, 21. And Philippians 2, verse 9, the scripture said that by conquering sin and grave, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. In the terms of Psalm 2, we should kiss his feet. And so the PowerPoint presentation, the slideshow of Psalm 2, makes this abundantly clear, clear, beloved. Don't be alarmed because of all the disturbing things that go around us, goes around you. All that noise, all that worldly commotion won't last. What it does show is God's wrath and judgment. Therefore, don't wander away on the broad way of evil. Be wise. That is what the psalm commands us. Be wise. Humbly submit to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. An obedient life with God's word open than this clear window. You are saved through him. He is the only refuge from the storm of God's anger. What he has declared, Matthew 28, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Oh, we love it. Therefore, you are again now sent into this world 
to confess and to proclaim that our Lord Jesus Christ will, with an iron rod, subdue all powers and authority. For he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Let us pray. We thank you, God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for your word. Your word is the power of salvation. Our trust is in your Son because he has worked our hope that is now laid up for us in heaven. For there he ascended in his throne. And that hope is our anchor. May we have our joy in you as our God because of your redeeming work by your Son, our King. He has delivered us from all darkness and transferred us to your kingdom. And we have much longing, may we live towards the coming of his kingdom. He Maranatha, we pray, O Lord God, uh, O Lord Jesus Christ, come soon. Amen.